Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, our next event. Please let me know if everyone can hear me and see me okay. Maybe a quick thumbs up in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. So welcome, everyone. My name is Juliette Greenberg. I work with New Media Manitoba. Uh, we're a nonprofit industry association dedicated to supporting the interactive digital media industry. Uh, we're so happy that you joined us tonight uh, for our next Manitoba Women in Tech event. I think the last virtual event we had was back in May. So we have so many exciting things to share with all of you tonight. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I just want to bring my script over here. Uh, I want to respectfully acknowledge that we are meeting virtually on the ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional gathering place of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the traditional homeland of the Red River Métis people. For those who are joining MBWTEC for the first time, our events are brought to you by the Combined Forces of New Media Manitoba, Tech Manitoba, and North Forge Technology Exchange. And we are also super excited to welcome back Whitney Moore from North Forge, uh, back to the executive committee uh, and our group after being away for uh, quite some time to start raising her family. So everyone give her a big welcome back to the group. Uh, Whitney, we're really happy to have you back on the team. So, our three nonprofit organizations, together with our allies, are here to support and share experiences. We applaud accomplishments and promote tech activities in a safe, gender inclusive, and judgment free environment. We have regular virtual get togethers for anyone working in and with tech uh, uh, who would like to meet other women and allies working in tech and beyond. We're a vibrant community in Manitoba, and joining these events is a great way to experience that firsthand. We do have a code of conduct for all events, but it basically says, please be kind and respectful to one another other, and support each other. Uh, we encourage you to review that code of conduct through the chat. Uh, we also regularly survey our attendees to make sure that the content and the formats uh, work for the majority of our members. Uh, so starting this year, uh, we'll actually be hosting both virtual and in-person events so that we can connect with as many people in Winnipeg uh, as well as throughout the province. We're very fortunate to have many folks who do work in the tech industry in attendance tonight. It's likely you have one at your table now. Shout out to our amazing volunteers and all of you who continue to help facilitate conversation uh, and answer questions about this meetup, uh, Remo, the local tech community, or connecting with other like-minded individuals. And now Lori and Whitney and I uh, are really happy to jointly announce that our once very small group has now grown to over 1,000 members, which is incredible. So shout out to everybody who has helped us to grow this community and to grow our connections. We couldn't have gotten this far without all of you. And another big piece of news is we have a new name. We are now called the Manitoba Women in Tech Meetup Series, powered by BDC Capital's Women in Technology and Thrive Venture Funds. So this is, a, this is a really big deal. This is very exciting. Uh, we now uh, are, are very supported. Uh, again, our, our three organizations are nonprofit and BDC has come in with just some wonderful support. And this fund, uh, the Thrive Venture Funds, uh, aim to connect women in tech throughout Manitoba to advance gender equality and promote the advancement of women in tech. So BDC is generously sponsoring our technology platforms that are essential in us connecting with you, our members, through both Meetup and on Remo. And they have also generously offered to sponsor our in-person events so we can all enjoy some tasty food and beverages when we do get together in person. 
please give a big thank you to BDC. And if you want to learn more, we have another event to announce this, this fund next week. So next Tuesday, October 25th, uh, during the lunch hour, we will all get to learn how the women-led businesses can access venture capital through BDC's Thrive Venture Fund. It's the largest inv investment platform of its kind in the world. Um, so next Tuesday, Mona Minhas, partner venture, venture capital, women in technology will answer any and all questions that you might have about how you can take advantage of the fund and grow your Canadian business. This event will be hosted uh, by all the executive uh, folks at, at Manitoba Women in Tech, and it's open to all women entrepreneurs in Manitoba. We encourage you to join us to learn more uh, about the fund and if it's a fit for you or the organization. We're also really excited to announce that we're hosting another in-person event on November 30th, and it's gonna be located at the Smart Park at 100 Innovation Drive at U of M, same place that we had uh, our, our summer event. Uh, we've just posted that online, so please make sure to RSVP as well. Um, and um, yeah, we'll keep you up to date with all the exciting things for that November 30th in-person event. All right, so next, I am so pleased to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, Adele, it's up to you. You're welcome to come up on stage now, or you can join me in a bit. Great, there she is. So um, Adele Riertz, she is Principal Consultant and Senior User Experience Architect for Online Business Systems. So I met Adele uh, working together, I want to say maybe six or seven years ago, um, and immediately recognized that she had mad skills and uh, a really well thought out approach to uh, user centric interactive design. And uh, I'm so pleased that she's joining us. Uh, she's a Winnipeg based user experience architect, artist, color lover and warrior princess family woman. She's an entrepreneurial self starter who is passionate about helping people work. As a UX architect and strategic leader with a background in visual design, copywriting, and creative direction, she's mastered these skills. She explored the underlying structures for creating great work, viability, desirability, and feasibility. She's been fortunate to ride the wave of the new technology starting in the, in the 2000 tech bubble throughout the transformation of advertising, digital products, and now she's working uh, and looking into the new possibilities for emerging tech, data, and the human experience. She thrives to mentor, facilitate great conversations, and create delight in unexpected places. So we're so excited to see what you have in store for us, Adele. Thanks, Juliet. Oh, my so pleasure. Nice to see you. So nice you to see everyone who showed up today. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah. so you, you can uh, feel free to take the stage and, and, and present uh, whenever you're ready. I will be off screen, but here for you if you need me. Okay, wonderful. I will just get this screen, screen shared. Hold on. Don't want to give it all away. Can you see everything all right? Sorry, I can't. I'm going to have to come back. That's okay. Absolutely, Adele. We can definitely <laughs> okay. see your screen. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, thank you, Juliet, for that very warm introduction. Uh, she's right. My name is Adele Rewerts, and I am a user experience architect for online business systems here in Winnipeg. Um, so one of the things I found is that design has become a limiting word. After 25 years of doing everything from designing ski suits to helping billion dollar companies launch their first mobile products, it's exactly what I do, but nothing like those outside of the profession expect. 
did I know that I was part of a global movement to change the way we approach tech? Hell no. <laughs> um, in fact, I was just adapting the way I approach print design with the new medium and the new tools available to me. As a UX architect, I help cross-functional teams turn insight into ideas, into products that work for businesses and users by starting from the user point of view. Now, this is not new. Every designer from the first sign painter to toy makers to Steve Jobs knows that you can achieve business success if people don't want what you're selling. But as the world got so excited about the quickly expanding tech innovations, we didn't all stop to think if anyone wanted any of them. <laughs> we just kept building and people kept buying because it was exciting and it was new. But now tech is pervasive and the market is crowded. Consumers have a real choice and it's become obvious that we need to build products for real people. So just a bit of a throwback here. Maybe you'll recognize a few of these from around the city circa the year 2000. Um, I spent the first years of my career here in Winnipeg at a few small design studios, and it was incredibly valuable. It was creative, it was empowering, and I designed everything from launch materials for the first Manitoba Audio Recording Industry Association <laughs> website, art directed photo shoots for Shoppers Optical and Cambrian Credit Union, uh, created custom illustrations, designed magazines, and even created the ski suits I told you about. You can see right in the middle there. I was very, very much your typical graphic designer when I left to explore my career in tech. So fast forward 20 years, and here I am. Um, most of my work product looks something like this slide. I spend most of my day working on the process for great work instead of the final product. And I had no idea this was even a job. I don't even think it was a job title back in uh, 1999 or whenever I graduated. Um, and I think that's the situation for many of us. The world is changing so quickly and it's possible that the job we're doing in 10 years doesn't even exist as such today. I thought I'd share with you a bit of my career journey and discuss some of the aspects um, that I think might help you prepare for an unknown career destination. So the first thing um, I'd like to talk about is being T-shaped. Um, you might also have heard it called a, a generalizing specialist. And this means having one or more core competencies and a breadth in other related competencies. And the reason this is important is because the nature of our work is changing. It's becoming less hierarchical and more collaborative. It's becoming value-driven, intersectional, and entrepreneurial. But becoming T-shaped also allows you to pivot. Pivot when your work situation changes, when the industry recesses, or when you want to try something new. This is what my tea looks like. And I'm not even sure this is complete. Um, designers were always considered T-shaped. You had to understand the business purpose, the audience and the tools to connect the message to the desired intent and action. So I immediately started as a bit of a T, uh, learned design, printmaking and development. But right about here, somewhere in here, um, I hit the glass ceiling. Um, I remember the day when I realized it wasn't about me personally, that was actually kind of validating, um, but just that systemically people saw what I offered as superfluous. And at that point, I'd been working as a designer, a designer developer and digital art director for about 10 years. I had won multiple awards, um, but since I had started at a tech agency, I just, I felt really boxed in. Like all I was there to do was make something pretty and I felt like if I couldn't go up, I would go wide. So at first it started with things like user research, which wasn't something we called user research back then. It was just learning from users. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and then I found out more about UX. I found out more about business analysis. And again, not even sure I knew that those were the titles of the things. I just kept following my interests and the opportunities that were in front of me. Uh, the T that you're looking at looks a little more like a rectangle. Um, and it's maybe not as common in UXers these days now that they have more formal user experience training. Um, but for senior UXers of a certain vintage, uh, whether by design or accident, we created this field through trial and error. So we all came from different backgrounds and many of us have, have something that looks like this. Um, 
And I don't think I'm alone. I'm sure that many of you have depth in multiple competencies, more than we could probably list, and, and maybe even more than our, our, co our coworkers are aware of. So I, I first learned about this T-shaped concept from an innovation design company called The Moment. It's based in Toronto. They have a worksheet uh, that helps determine whether they would consider you an innovation designer. There's many aspects to innovation and each project is so different. Having breadth allows teams to work intersectionally to find new ideas. And I don't think it matters what field you're in. We're seeing this trend taking shape across all industries. And again, it's not a new concept. Anybody in a small business or an entrepreneurial field since the beginning of work has had to be T-shaped. Leonardo da Vinci is a prime example, but I think about farmers and restaurateurs and designers. Um, we used to say, build something you wanna use. But we're learning now that because makers all came from a similar context, their products were only hitting the mark for certain groups of people. We're learning that diversity and intersectionality is not just morally and ethically right, but it's also good for productivity and good for business. So it means that you could bring your entire self into your work if you chose to. You could contribute based on your unique set of skills. And I'm wondering, how would that change the way you work? So let's see here, just click the next slide. Um, think about your career and head with me over to Menti. You can use your phone and just grab that, um, that little QR code, or you can go to Menti and enter to menti.com and enter 2104-9178. And just think for a minute about what kind of skill or passion that you would love to bring to your work. Let's see what kind of hidden talents are out there in our, in our audience today. I'm gonna go over to Menti and you can see the code right here. Your name won't be associated with what you post, by the way. <laughs> So many of you are ready to be UXers. Look at this. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Coaching, empathy, and appreciation of leisure, communication, compassion, strategy, curiosity. Oh, that's a good one. And that would be hard if you feel like you're not being able to bring that to your work today. Vulnerability. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. This is really fun, this word cloud. <laughs> art. Oh, yes. Speaking to my speaking to my heart there. And maybe my kid's heart you could see behind me. Okay. Debate. Ooh. Continual learning. Oh, wow, you guys, this is amazing. Lateral thinking, very fun. And look at that understanding. It's like in creativity right at the top. That's pretty, that's pretty exciting. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Uh, here we go. All right, so you're bringing this stuff to work. Your Renaissance T-shaped powerhouse um, and ready to take on the world, but how do you apply that? And, and I think it can be really hard to understand where you fit in, particularly, I'm just gonna drop my little feminist bomb here, but when capitalism has only deemed certain things valuable, right? Still, a lady's gotta earn, and I find this particular diagram really insightful because it provides some additional lenses. For instance, if you start at the top, um, let's say you have a good job and doing what earns you money um, and what you love, but look at that. It, it doesn't actually mean that you're super good at it, which I find I found kind of surprising. Um, when, you, when you find that part where you really shine, then you'll have the opportunity to serve. And when you take this good job and adapt it to what the world needs, there's your opportunity for growth. And for a long time, I felt like I was in that good job space. 
but I kept getting pigeonholed into profession, probably because I'm incredibly curious and I kept loving new things and I kept finding roles where I would excel and it would earn me money, but I wasn't challenged. I had to sneak in opportunities to serve. And this is where I'd volunteer to help with new projects, data visualization, or apply my passions to new projects. But it was still a struggle because the world didn't know they needed me yet. So here's what I did to try and find value to serve. Um, I had been following this blog series called Show Your Work, and it was mostly about actresses and how they would kind of demonstrate their capabilities and then when they and build their own opportunities and be ready when those opportunities were there. Um, so at the top, you'll see uh, the currency converter for Wanda.com, just circa 2009. <laughs> but when I started there, I just had a computer, nothing else. Um, there was no one on my team. And I just sat in a pod with some other people trying to figure out what to do. When left to my own devices, I came up with a new logo, um, new branding for the website. And I even proposed a, a new currency converter. But none of these projects saw the light of day until we had installed a marketing director and then also another product owner who needed opportunities, right? So um, on, the, on the right, you'll see a dashboard I created. It was uh, for a global participation report for Wellness Checkpoint. And at the time, I had time and one of the analysts had data. So we worked together to tell a new story. My boss insisted it was a waste of time um, until a client expressed a need. And then here it was ready to go. And below is a cut of Verbea. It's an online version of Toyota's famous Obea rooms. Now this isn't the live tool we launched with. In fact, I didn't even design that tool. <laughs> Instead, I was working on a side project to reimagine it, to see what else was possible. But while I was working on it, Microsoft needed an app to launch on their first Surface Hub back in like 2017 or 2018. And lo and behold, here's my little side project now being launched as the first productivity app to come default on the Surface Hub. The common thread in these stories is that even though I was hired to create change, people just didn't know what to do with me. I had to wait for the right opportunity. It's a bit of one of those skate to where the puck is going situations, but for designers. And um, in the meantime, I experienced a bit of, well, call it unpleasantness. <laughs> it wasn't easy. It turns out I am a disruptor. Um, I am also a Libra, so I did not like being a disruptor. And it's not because I see myself as a great visionary or a hero. It's just because I looked at the world differently than my colleagues. And it meant that my very presence was often a disruption to the status quo, my ideas, my work product, and even my femininity. I experienced a lot of resistance in the workplace. And I'm going to be frank, that's what I promised in the description. It was everything from passive resistance to ignoring me in meetings, not giving me work, to a more aggressive resistance. I was yelled at, name called, um, complaints were fabricated, and I was even pushed. Um, it built up my resilience, but it was hard. I tried staying in the corner, uh, but that just wasn't a long-term solution for me. I cried in the bathroom. Um, also not a long-term solution. Um, and I tried going to my boss, but the particular boss just said she really loved the team's passion. So there, there wasn't really an opportunity there to get some assistance. So I doubled down and I'm a bit of a, I'm sure it's fine to say I'm a bit of a shit disturber. <laughs> so I tried humor. I tried being a little mischievous. I stood my ground. Uh, if, if I needed to, I left a meeting and I left certain workplaces. But you know what? I never stopped because I am just a little bit relentless that way. Um, which is why I read my girls this book, <laughs> Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Um, and if you get a chance, it would be really helpful to look at the story of uh, Bibi Vio, who is a fencer who uh, became a world champion without any arms or any legs. So when I couldn't control the outcomes of my projects or even my involvement, I started looking at the process. 
Now, this wasn't a process that existed as such, although I'm sure now you, you're, there's lots of books and different blog posts on different areas I'm about to show you. It was mostly through instinct and trial and error that I ended up utilizing the same steps that I now take with clients um, as a UX architect. So the first thing I did was I wondered how could UX or me as a person support the project purpose? So I had to look at what was my coworker trying to do? Um, how could I help, right? I, instead of doing user research, I was doing coworker research. So I observed and I listened to what they were doing, what they were trying to get out of it and the challenges that they were having. And then this is a, a value proposition canvas but I was where I would normally, you know, with a client match user needs to features that we'd want to build. I was looking at, you know, what are my coworkers needs and what are my opportunities to help them out? Where was my thin edge of the wedge? And then I was also looking at, you know, where were people open to my involvement? These were my innovators. Those are usually the people who hired me. And then where were my early adopters? You know, the people within the company who were interested in what I had to say. Um, and who were my laggards? Who really did not want what I was selling? <laughs> and maybe those people were not projects that I tried to get involved in, right? And once I had a little bit of traction, which I had a little bit of involvement, um, I, I sought to understand how I could scale my influence within the organization. You know, whether that was lunch and learns or building up my team, um, trying to get new products or launching side products for the company. I was looking for opportunities to take my little bit of a win and grow it. So now here I am, I'm 43 years old and I'm a UX architect. Have I made it? <laughs> Is UX architecture my ikigai? Um, I'm going to go with no, uh, but it is a path that's getting me close. I'm hitting my stride and I'm really starting to understand my value, which isn't in the work product. It's not in all those little blue dots on my T. It's in the spaces in between. The timing of this presentation has been really advantageous. I know it looks like I've had all this success, but really a few years ago, I had been so disillusioned by my career about the pushback and my lack of momentum and all the effort it took. I hit my 20 year mark um, in a, as a worker um, and was leaning out to have a baby at the same time. And I took that year to reflect. I joined a women's networking group and I learned that some of the most amazing and accomplished women were feeling the same way that I was. They had all this value and knowledge and they were pulled in so many directions they were tired and disillusioned, but still driven, still searching, like me. What I came to realize is that when you're in your 40s, you know something. You know something about work, and you know something about life. And you are uniquely positioned to handle all of these, all of the things, the family, the house, the illness, aging parents, community. They make you a fuller person at home and at work. They force you to focus on what you value to learn to differentiate what's important from what's really important. For me, all that pushback I had received taught me resilience and made me look at the process of work, but I also really started to understand the process of living, which was interesting. The birth of my second child showed me my strength, maybe because there were no drugs, um, but it was definitely a moment of renewal. And then last year, my dad, who you can see right there, he. He died suddenly and I was forced to grow again. Any pretense I had fell away and I felt incredibly vulnerable. I was met with some incredibly compassionate people at my workplace. And I have to admit, it changed the way that I related to the world, to my family and to my work. In my grief and in that compassion, I saw the world differently. And now I can't unsee it. This past year, my work has taken on a new kind of momentum that I'm only learning to understand. And I don't think I've quite yet learned to articulate or articulate it. And uh, just to get a little, a little frank, um, when I was telling Juliet about it, I said, 
when you let your last fuck go, it really opens you up in new ways. So I don't know what's next for me, um, but I do know that evolution is the only option. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening and for spending your time with me. Amazing, Adele. Very inspiring. I uh, I just want to thank you for sharing uh, everything that you did. Um, yeah, it's not easy to share and be vulnerable, um, but I'm so happy that you felt uh, comfortable enough to share your story with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much for asking me, Juliet. Yeah. You, uh, you yeah. definitely make people feel comfortable oh, being themselves. Good. Good. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is an exciting time uh, in, in our industry. And, and I agree at our age, really at any age coming in, because everything changes so fast. Um, but I think that's, that's the point that you're trying to make is things are changing so fast. There's only one choice, but to uh, change along with it. And um, I, I almost wish people uh, had told us in our, you know, at the beginning of our careers that what what you choose to do next as your role might not be what you're going to be doing forever. So don't pigeonhole yourself either and, and give yourself options to explore your tea. Yeah, I had this weird idea, too, that um, not weird. I think of many of us have this idea like there was my professional self and there was my personal self. And it was amazing when I hit this spot where I realized that I was a whole person and that all the things that I was learning at work or learning at home or being challenged by um, were actually making me fuller overall. And so there was that really big glass ceiling moment where I started looking at the process at work and the process of my life at the same time. And it like everything started to change and click a little differently. And I, I kind of wish I had a different outlook earlier. And that, that would be an advice I give my, I give my uh, 20 year old self, but uh, you can't, you can't learn to be vulnerable until you've been knocked about of it sometimes, or at least me, I'm a bit stubborn. I mean, that's why I, <laughs> as I mentioned, I hear you. Well, we do. Um, we do have some questions, Adele, that oh, sure. I would like um, to make sure to ask uh, because, uh, yeah, it was a very insightful presentation. So why don't we start from the top? How do you bring new ideas to a supervisor or a decision maker in a manner that doesn't intimidate them or that just gets them to take notice. So the pitching to the boss. Okay, so I'm um I'm I can be a bit sly because I've tried I tried just like pitching ideas. Some people like pitching, but a lot of times I've found that I just kind of toss ideas over the fence like spaghetti. Um, and what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And people hate a lot of my ideas, um, but occasionally one sticks. And another thing I, I did when I was in person at that, um, that one company where I did all the data visualization, showed you wellness checkpoint there, mm -hmm. I would just work ahead and I would show my work by just like putting it around the office. Like for when people walked in, they would see like a Sankey diagram or like a new report. Um, so I, I kind of, sometimes I kind of go with a bit of a marketing approach and like if you see it five times and you'll, <laughs> you'll take it on. Um, sometimes I'll write blog posts or just, you know, sneak ideas into, uh, other ideas so that slowly the idea of it becomes less frightening. Yeah. Normalized. Yeah. A little normalized. That's a good mm -hmm. way to put it. Mm -hmm. So now that I've shared all those secrets, um, and there's a few coworkers on my, <laughs> on the call, uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> see how effective that is in the next week. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, I think those are all great ideas, Adele. I think that makes sense. And, you know, it helps for people to see something visual to really grasp an idea. And, uh, you know, depending on how you absorb what kind of person you are, if you, you're visual or auditory, 
you know, have, having it repeated and at least giving people the opportunity to share their thoughts around it either way. Yeah, that, that customer adoption model is actually more insightful than I had realized when I first saw it. Um, I think you were there when I saw it. Um, because there are people who are just not going to be interested in what you're saying. And so it doesn't mean you should stop marketing. It just means it's going to take them longer to come around. And so you sort of have to sometimes realize you're a little bit ahead of other people and give them breadcrumbs, mm -hmm. you know, find problems that you are actually solving for them and, and, and build it up for them because yeah, sometimes they just don't get it. <laughs> Fair. Okay. We have another question. Uh, why do you think that you were confronted with so much resistance? Can you be an accepted disruptor? Oh, How? maybe. Um, I think you could be male. Um, <laughs> I have tried a lot of things. Humor helps, like just coming in with like a really positive attitude. Um, but I think I was young and I looked young. Um, ambitious and smart. And I put people, whether I wanted to or not, I just put them on the defensive. I was challenging their mental model of what a designer was supposed to be. So it wasn't something I had a problem with in, mm -hmm. in the advertising world because everyone was like me, right? I wasn't that different. I was maybe a bit more nerdy than your typical art director, but it was all good. Um, but when I got into tech, it was like, you know, fitting into the box I had for you. And it bothers me. And so I, I, I don't know that I tried a lot of approaches. I don't know that anything I could have done would have been different. I think it was just the fact that I was challenging people in ways they didn't want to be challenged. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to be honest, it still happens. Um, but because I have a little more confidence, um, I'm maybe a little less, you know, I just know who to, whatever, you don't get it, you know? And I just toss <laughs> them aside. You'll come around later. You just got to figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, sometimes it does take people some time to get comfortable with a new idea or change. That's very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird sometimes because you think that people have hired you because of the change you're going to bring. And so maybe sometimes too, like, I don't know, you've probably had it at your workplace. Like you have ideas that you're trying to bring forward and then some new person comes and they just sell it through and you're like, what the hell? I've been saying this for years, right? And so I think, um, or maybe you come and you're just very, they want change, but they're not ready for it. I think that would sometimes happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I think having a few more years of maturity under my belt has given me a bit, a bit more of a measured approach than maybe I would have taken with the urgency of my like 25 year old self. Right. Yep, that makes sense. Wonderful. Okay, uh, here's another very good question. What do you find is the best way to assert yourself in the workplace to get supervisors to take you seriously? Um, so, um, you know, asserting yourself in the workplace, I mean, that has some connotation around it, but I, you get the flavor of what they're, what they're asking. Yeah, so the thing that I've found works for me it's really like doubling down with my maturity. So I remember I told you I got pushed. I did get pushed. I got pushed right over in front of a child that I was trying to like, hey, welcome to the office. Um, and I just looked up at this very tall man and said, is that what you wanted to do? And, and then he came back later and he apologized. Um, I found that when I take the high road and maybe a slight like, I don't know how to explain it, but there's a certain confidence in that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I used to get called princess a lot at work. And and finally I just said, listen, don't call me princess. And I didn't say it in a mean way or an angry way. I didn't even I didn't say it in a weak way. I, was, I said it in a way like, this is my boundary and just don't do that. And it seemed, it seems to help me anyway, if when I find my voice, maybe it's my mom voice. Maybe, that, maybe that's what helped. I also was a teacher for a while. And that, I think, like, finding that, like, that voice really helped me. Right. Um, 
Yeah, but checking checking in with them is that is that really what you meant to say and giving them a chance to reflect on their own words and delivery. Yeah, the high someone wrote the high road. Yeah, when they go when they go low, we go high. Those words from Michelle Obama. I think mm -hmm. I think it's the best way to go. I've tried a bunch of things, poking the bear a little bit, um, but that's that's usually when you've pushed me way too far. <laughs> Yeah, doesn't well, we really all, work. It doesn't right. really work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a, some more questions for you, Adele. Oh, what are God. your What are your thoughts about the future of UX and technology uh, in in emerging tech? And uh, I mean, even in some of the ways that like some of what online focuses on. That's really interesting because, you know, as we're getting into let's say like the metaverse or and things like this. Um, it's not just like UX, right? It, like our idea of UX. So there's, there's hitting designing features that people need. That's like the core and that's not going anyway. But the way we approach design and user experience and best practices, um, I think is really going to be interesting and cross functional as designers, because you're going to see like interior design and game design, and interface design really like coming together in new ways. So um, it could get really interesting. I, I'm, I'm very excited to see, to see how these um, design collaborations will take place. You know, we kind of usually just say like, oh, you're the designer. <laughs> but I, I think we're going to start to see a lot of cross pollination there. Yes. And you're reminding me, I'm not allowed to call you a designer. I, <laughs> I mean, I, like, I am, I am what I am, but yeah. I finally kicked that title, which is nice. Um. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. We've got some more questions and we're going to keep going here. How can you persuade someone high up in the food chain to be your sponsor, to help you progress in the workplace? So your champion. Uh, oh man. So someone, someone, I guess it's, yeah, someone that may be a, a, a little bit higher of a role than yourself, but that can still be a champion to help you progress in the workplace. I mean, how do you persuade anyone, right? It's, you've got to show your value to them. So there's some, there's going to be something, some place you've interacted with them where you can showcase why you rock, you know, and they're going to have to have some kind of need. So if, so, if, if nobody, if the person you're hoping to be your champion doesn't have a need for what you're selling or hasn't had an opportunity rather to see the value demonstrated that you're bringing to the table, it doesn't have to be design. It could just be ideas or whatever it is that you do. Um, it's going to be difficult for them to agree to be your sponsors. You've kind of got to create, you've got to UX it a little bit and create this opportunity for them to come to you with like, oh, she's awesome. I just want to be I want to help her. I want to be part of her career, her career circle. Yeah. And make yourself present, you know, like sh showing up uh, is a big part of it too. Uh, well, know. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Yeah. And that's one of the challenges we have is um, if you're in a caregiving role, yes. um, because you have to try to find ways to, to be present or if you're just in a busy role, like sometimes, with consulting, you could be off by yourself, you know, at a client and like nobody in the company sees you. So you have to take some extra efforts to make sure your work product is shown. One of the ways I did it is you'll see on the online blog, how many blog posts are under my name. And so when I had opportunity, I was just like, tappity tap, tap, tap everyone. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, like, and then people could see what I meant, right. Um, and see the value that I was trying to bring and the, the things I tried to mean something. And then I started meeting more people with, with similar mindsets, being invited to things. Thank you for that. Okay. More questions. How can leaders be more supportive of creative disruptors in their workplace to bring up the best in the whole team, including the disruptor? What a wonderful question. That is wonderful. Oh yeah. man. That's trying to think back down to my little teams. Um, I think you need to have empathy towards the person who's disrupting, right? Because there's a tendency for us to think 
there's like a bias, like they're disrupting, they're causing me to put so much attention on this person that's bad. But what if it could be, what if you could change your bias to say like, what's a good thing? Why is this person always bothering me about this? Like have that one-on-one -on -one chat, understand what this, what is making them tick so that you can start to help them piece the value with um, their ideas together and, and bridge that gap. Like you might need to, especially if they're younger, you might need to give them a little bit more, more advice on how to, how to make those connections. I know for me, when I was younger, I'd ask questions about business and people would be like, why are you asking me this? And all I knew was that I needed to understand the business purpose, but I didn't know what questions to ask because they didn't really teach us that part in design school. So, so sometimes it felt like I was asking the wrong questions. So just having like a guide, which I, I did end up finding, um, to sort of show you how to ask the right questions or what those right questions are. Um, I found that to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a wonderful point. That's something very, very tangible and doable for, for leaders when you've got your staff coming to you with ideas, help, helping them through the right way to ask the questions so that they can give them the answers they need. Okay. Adele, have you also felt worried about work direction or what position, sorry, have you also felt worried about work direction or what position I want to focus on before when you were like myself, who is almost nearing the end of my program? Oh, are you thinking about like school? I'm guessing um, this is about a school program. Let's see in the chat. Anyone? Oh, there's a Q and A button. I could probably just read yes. It. All right. yes, yes. <laughs> um, Worried about okay. your direction. So when I was in school, I was really, I don't know, like amped up about design. So I wasn't worried at that time, but I I was worried um, a couple of years ago, and I'd been doing this for quite a while. Um, I was also worried when I moved to Winnipeg, and I wasn't sure if I'd what kind of career I'd have when I moved back. No offense to anyone, but I had no sense of what's going on in the industry locally. Um, and so what I did um, was I stuck my nose out into a bunch of places to see. Um, a couple of years ago, before I started online, I was wondering, is there a career for me in UX anymore in Winnipeg? And so I was applying for all sorts of weird roles, BA, director of this. I was, I was like, is this, is this a place for me? Is this a home for me? Because people weren't putting UX architect in a job description, but I had met my current manager. Um, I think I was recruited, but I met him and we didn't, I didn't, we didn't go down that path at the time, but we got each other and it was really good. And so later when we connected again and we were both in a better place for this fit to happen, um, it worked out really well. So so my suggestion would be is if you're not sure what direction it is, especially when you're young um, or just starting out, see where you can get a toe in. Like what's your thin edge of the wedge, right? Find, try a bunch of new things, try it out and then learn. It's just like any innovation, right? Try something, learn and then try something else if it's not, if it's not the right fit, but you're not gonna know it until you try. Turns out I don't wanna be a BA. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out <laughs> through trial and error and experimenting and, and not being scared of it, not working out. That's a big part of it too. That's why I was mentioning like what, what I do next might not be what I do forever for the rest of my life, but I will learn something from it. Even if it isn't, you know, a long-term fix, there'll always be yeah. something that you get out of it. Once you hit that first big loss under your belt um, and you recover, Mm -hmm. it really helps you to, to take a few more risks, right? When you know that you can trust yourself or you can trust your community to hold you up. If, if something falls apart, I found that to be very, very helpful to me, but it, it took a big fear out of, out for me. Cause I actually was laid off before. And I, I spent a year teaching high school before I decided to go back to school for multimedia and move to Toronto. And I felt so supported by my family, by my community that offered me this wonderful job as a teacher. And I loved teaching um, that I that I 
I just, I was able to take a big risk like that when previously I was too scared to leave the province for school. So, um, yeah, sometimes it takes a risk to know that you, you can hold your own. Absolutely. Oh, I love this. So how did you reach the point of like how you said giving your last fuck? No, it wasn't fun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I would say that I experienced some really big hardships. Um, you know, I would it just in the five years before, um, particularly with um, some some challenges at work, really set me back and affected my mental health. And I ended up then struggling after the birth of my first child, and it led to postpartum depression and all this anxiety. And and I was just like. Ah, and like really just worried and my health was going terrible. Um, and I had to kind of like learn through it, right? Learn through it, learn through the chronic health problems and mental health things. And the, then I had this other baby. It's a bit restorative. I, was so, I felt so good. But I also like just knew what I didn't care about and it really helped me set my values right. And then, And then when my dad died, I just didn't care about anything, but, you know, like, it's just, I don't know. It just reset everything for me. And, um, all the things that mattered to me became like super crystal clear. So unfortunately to get to that point of, of losing all pretense, um, probably have to experience some pretty challenging moments. Although some people are just born with that. Like they're just much more carefree than, than maybe I, I was naturally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, this next question is is also very interesting. You know, the tech industry is very male dominated, as we know. Do you have any tips on how to navigate workplaces where you might be the only woman or one of a few women on the team? I have not worked at a place maybe one place where it was equal. (laughs) Um, And there were two women and one man. Um, So yes, I have worked in those situations a lot. And um, it can, uh, it can be challenging. Um, Again, I think that a lot of it, like comes down to just understanding your colleagues and where they're coming from. Cause unfortunately you can't make other people understand you. I've tried that. That doesn't work. Um, so, so even though you're in this male dominated place, um, as long as the behavior isn't toxic, um, just treating people like people and kind of putting that part to the side and just like, just like working with the person in front of you, but there are going to be moments where, I mean, it sucks and I don't want to have to say it, but there's going to be moments where you're going to have to be the bigger person and you may have to call people out or leave situations if it feels dangerous or unsafe for you. Um, Which is really that that's almost gender non-specific, but um, yeah, (laughs) you're going to have to be okay with being different. Is really what I think it comes down to, which is not always, um, not always the easiest. If I don't, I don't know who asked that question, but you can always message me um, over LinkedIn or something like that. We can chat a little more specifically um, Mm -hmm. about about tips or things that I've dealt with. Yeah, and you know, coming, I find that you know, make trying to make connections, uh, you know, with other women, you know, that have similar interests can can really also be very helpful. Um, I know a big part of uh, my growth in the industry was discovering that I I was missing certain things from some of my workplaces. uh, And it was that empathy and it was that connection. And, you know, much like your story, you know, through that experience of discovering what I needed, I realized that's that's a direction I want to go. So it's, it, it's fascinating that sometimes, yeah, what, what it is that you're needing, you can find out you can create for yourself uh, and, and for others. So if, um, yeah, for whoever wrote that, that question, uh, keep coming back <laughs> to MB with Tech and making great connections. We're, we're here to support you. 
Uh, is there still room in UI UX uh, to be a freelance designer? Where would one even start if you have basic graphic design skills? So yeah, there's totally room to be a freelancer. Um, it happens all the time, right? Even small product teams will just be like, we don't have a user experience designer and they'll, they'll hire that out or um, depending on what type of um, user experience work that you're looking to do. There are a lot of places to start. I would think like any entrepreneur, you need to find somebody who wants UX work. So networking, um, banner ads, getting a website out there, like anything you can do to start validating that somebody would want what you have to sell um, is a good start. And then also, I don't know if this is still the case, but I used to go to freelance.com, I think it was, and they had like a great calculator to start figuring out your rates and getting tips and tricks and things like that. There's also um, this community called the Rising Tide Society on Instagram where you know a lot of um, makers or similar um, uh, you know post tips on how to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Great, great suggestions. A um, couple more questions here, Adele. Thank you for for going through all of them. These Thank are you for asking me questions. Yeah, really this is wonderful. fantastic. Uh, were you anxious about expanding your tea? What advice do you have for a person leaving school who wants to expand their own tea? Great question. Um, at first I wasn't because I just assumed that was part of my role, right? Because I was like wearing many hats in this tiny design studio. So you just did whatever came to you and, and all the other designers you know, that you would look up to kind of had a similar profile. Um, later, when I was thinking about, you know, my role in that product company, and I kind of hit that ceiling. And I was wondering about this user experience thing. I was a little bit more nervous because I didn't know what it was. And I wasn't sure how to understand it. And it it took a, a really good webinar and book and all of a sudden it just like, Oh, okay. I get what this thing is. And I feel less scared about it. Um, so probably, you know, the best advice is to just be curious and follow your passions. This isn't the advice to become CEO. I'm not giving <laughs> cause I'm not a CEO. Um, but if you're looking for stuff that's going to keep you interested and growing, then that's, then follow your curiosity, follow the opportunities that are available to you and, and find out what's lighting you up. And, mm -hmm. and that could be anywhere that could be other meetups like this one. It could be, um, offline stuff. It could be music. And then later you realize that you could combine music with animation. And now it turns out you're like totally into music video direction, like, by following those passions, eventually you'll find the thing that you're, your icky guy, right? And then if you go back to that idea um, behind that slide I had, you can see where what you love and what you can get paid for and what you're good at start to merge together um, with what the world needs. And you can, you can find that special sauce that makes you you. Um. Yeah, so as far as developing your tea, I just wanted to kind of add to that. Like where do you th where do you think one could start? Like do you do you think it's better to start with okay, these are this is the the middle and these are this is the like role that I have and what I've been, you know, hired to do or something like that and then try to build up from there or did you would you start with the breadth and then find where your tea is? I mean, I guess it depends on where you're coming from. Some people are really just naturally quite, they have a lot of experience and may, uh, in many little things. And so you might want to find the one where you can maybe nail a bit more of a stake into the ground. Like I'd like to go a little bit deeper on this particular area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think it might help to write it down so you can actually see like, what can you do? I wish I had done that sooner. Um, and then and another way is to just, if you already have, like I was a designer, but then I was like, ooh, but what about flash? And what about coding? And what about like, what about this other thing? And you know, you're just finding opportunities to expand your curiosity just based on, based on what's near to you. That's, mine kind of ended up more that way. Um, mm -hmm. But 
that doesn't mean you can't go the other way. I think, I think it's a matter of might even be harder if you're somebody who's got a lot of breadth to find the thing that's making you feel really, really excited. Okay. We've got a few more questions and I think that's it for, because uh, we want, do want to get back to networking so more people can meet you and we can have some chat, but thank you everyone for these wonderful questions. Have you found that ageism crept in when you wanted to expand your tea um, as you progressed in your career? If so, uh, what was your best way to combat that? I think I started, like it was a, probably the opposite ageism. I was always told I was too young, right? Mm -hmm. You're too young. Oh, we're not going to give you any more work. Oh, 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 oh. Um, oh, I didn't think I was that young. I think I looked a lot younger than I was. Um, so I might have had it more on the opposite side. Um, where I'm at now, I don't feel like there's an ageism thing happening. Um, but I could see how it could feel that way. I think that if you're just expanding and you're curious, I don't, I have, like, I gotta say, I haven't really experienced it, but I, I really empathize with it because I, because it's real, it's a real thing. You know, I worry about, I almost had to expand my tea because I worried that like, as a designer, I wasn't going to be able to stay cool and relevant long enough. Right. I had to find a way, I had to find a way to stay like, <laughs> like someone would want to hire me because I wasn't like the cool, the cool young kid anymore. So, um, so yeah, I guess, I guess in that sense, I have, I have experienced it, but I wish I had more, I wish I had more of an example for you. Cause that, that was a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the other, um, women in the audience would want to answer it in the chat if they have any ideas or resources. Please do. Please do everyone. Uh, okay, we have one one last question, and then we're going to get back to some networking. Adele, thank you. Are you looking into new work or areas of work that is not your current one even now? Um, like so I, I, yeah, so like I've been exploring things. Right, there's this idea of like experience management or human experience design, where you're kind mm -hmm. of taking customer experience and user experience and uh, some other employee engagement. That's another one I get really excited about and, and, and kind of making it as a new holistic way of looking at experience. Um, but that's sort of mental for me. Like it's sort of like too cerebral. I think the next part of work is for me more about understanding and articulating what value I'm bringing to a project, because I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think it's UX architecture anymore. Like I'm good at UX architecture. I think it's something else. I think there's some other glue that I'm bringing in between all of those items. And it's become this uh, success thing at work and it's become really beautiful and wonderful. But like, what is that role? I call it sometimes UX anti. <laughs> I don't know what to call what I do to people um, um, or for people, not do people. But um, anyway, so yeah, I am exploring it, but I don't, I haven't yet seen the description that fits the way I'm feeling about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of, I'm lucky I work in a place busy, where I can kind of figure it out, you know? You're busy creating an another next role for you that doesn't have a definition. So yeah, may maybe you are, uh, maybe this is cyclical and you're getting to do yeah. To do Wonder, it is my manager on the call. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful, Adele. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, going through all those great questions. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the uh, great interaction as well. We are going to get back to some networking. Uh, probably until we're going to keep things open on the floor until about 7.20. Uh, 725 I'll come back for a quick wrap up uh, and then uh, and then we can all enjoy the rest of our evenings but yeah thank you so much for your presentation Adele Adele is staying uh, so if you do want to chat with her more at one of the tables uh, I think we're at table one and uh, yeah continue enjoying your your time networking with everyone
Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate you joining yeah. me here today. Cheers.